I'll do it a little bit of both. But there, uh, we have, all three of us were born in Morgan, but we were raised in Cornish. I don't know if you know what that is. A small town on the Idaho border, just north of here. Graduated from Skyview High School, first graduating class in 1965. And then from there, I came here. Yo tenía, yo tenía clases en español, portugués, alemán, inglés, todas las literaturas. Primeramente, yo quiero darles gracias al señor Bradford Hall y al señor González por darme el tiempo de estar con ustedes aquí. I really appreciate this opportunity because I love poetry, and I have since college. My wife and I entered a contest when we were here in 1970, and we both were published in a little book that used to be published here, but I don't think they do it anymore. But since then, I have been studying and doing poetry for years. I, I learned from one of my teachers at Skyview, and gained a love for poetry then. I didn't think I'd write that much, but it just over the years it just kept coming and coming. It's a gift. It's not, it's not my intelligence. It's nothing like that. It's a gift. And I have to admit that. And sometimes it'll come in the middle of the night. Sometimes it comes on a train. Sometimes it comes in a stadium, <laughs> really. And you just have to write it down. I'll get to that a little bit later, but Logan was much different when we were here. A lot smaller. I remember when there was a low-cost drug. You don't even know what that was. That's where we did our Christmas shopping most of the time. It was a small version of, well, not even Walmart. It was a small version of some of the other places, and that's where we did most of our Christmas shopping. Cornish is 25 miles from here, but we spent a lot of time in Logan. After I graduated in 1971, I had a fellowship to Indiana University. That was in 1972. We moved there. My wife and I were married in 1970, and then I graduated in 71. We moved in 1972. I, and I went there for a year. But at that time, if you recall, President Reagan put a hiring freeze in the government, and it, it also affected education. There were no uh, there were no education jobs. In the school that I was going to in university, we had um, 56 doctoral candidates. And of those doctoral <coughs> candidates that were going to be graduating, there were like 26 of them. Only two of them had had interviews, let alone even getting jobs. Our first child was born in, in Bloomington, Indiana. And my, I told my wife, I said, I don't want to go out in the world and try and make a living with a child and, and teach Spanish. Y yo no quise enseñar Doña Barbara por toda mi vida. <laughs> anyway, if you know Doña Barbara, it, it's the war and peace of Spanish literature. But at any rate, uh, so we moved to Chicago where my, my wife was born and raised and lived there for six years. I worked for a large, um, International Bank in their foreign exchange department. That's where I used my Spanish. But I had always picked up uh, Portuguese and was speak a lot of German. And in that department, they would bring all, all these emails and whatever back then that we got and these transmissions. They weren't by email, but we, we they would come to me in other languages and I had to translate Italian and German and <laughs> some things that I wasn't quite familiar with. But it was a good experience because we had a lot of Latinos in that department. And this one, uh, I recall one time there was this one little lady from uh, Bogota, Colombia was working there. She was having a, a hard time understanding the um, Afro-Americans that were working in our department. And she had to send some money to a bank in San Francisco, and she talked to this uh, Afro-American girl, and her, her 
accent was so thick that the poor girl from Bogota didn't understand her. And she says, this is an Espanol. She said, would you go ask her what she said to me? <laughs> so I had to be the inter intermediary. But that was an interesting job. But while I was there, I decided to go to law school. Applied to University of Chicago, Loyola, and DePaul because they were all close to Chicago, but also to Brigham Young and the University of Utah, and ex was accepted at BYU. So we moved from Chicago that year in 1978 to BYU, where I got my degree in law. And then I'm now a retired attorney. I worked for the Attorney General's office for a number of years. One of the most interesting things that I would learn in yes, Senor Gonzalez, debe saber eso. Um, they asked if there were any deputy attorney generals that could speak another language. Of course, I speak Spanish, so they they put us in this core of people, and they taught us at Princeton how to teach other people how to present a trial. So we learned a lot of these things. You know, I had I had done trials, but I had to learn some more things how to teach other people to do the same thing. And then they sent us to cities throughout the United States and in Mexico to teach the prosecutors how to present a trial. Because in Mexico they don't do trial work. But some of the states in Mexico have a, an agreement with the uh, attorneys general in the western part of the United States and they're changing their constitution so that they can present trials. Now for us it's really strange to think that. The only way that they even criminal trials, is they prepare a brief and then submit it to the judge and then he'd make the decision. But we were teaching them how to do it with the, the actual uh, jurados, what's the word in English? <laughs> Juries, yeah. So um, I did that for a while. Went to San Antonio, Phoenix, Boise, Salt Lake, LA, Santa Fe, and we taught the prosecutors that came across the border, but we also, they sent me to Saltillo, the Distrito Federal, Chetubal, Tijuana, in Mexicali, para dar las clases así. But that's, that's just a little background. We'll get into that a little later if you have any questions. Logan has really changed. <laughs> I was noticing that today. I used to even live on an apartment on the second north and just across the street on the west side they tore down a whole bunch of buildings that they're building something and my sister said, gee, what are they putting up here? Well, let's get to the subject. Again, thank you for this opportunity. I, I appreciate it gratefully so I can talk to you about one of my fun things. One thing I will tell you is if you love something and if you like to do it, just keep doing it. It may not make you a lot of money, and I don't expect to make a lot of money out of my poetry, but it's something I love to do. And I probably won't, but I love to do it. It's, it's just something fun, and I like to do it. Poetry is what I call the language of metaphor. Anybody know what a metaphor is? Got an idea? Tell me what a metaphor is. It's just like tying some some concept <coughs> to us through uh, an example or through an analogy of some sort. Okay. It's making comparisons. A simile is if you use like or as to make a comparison. A just plain metaphor. It, 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 the whole thing can be a metaphor. It represents something else. So I'm going to read you one of these poems. It's probably my favorite. As you can see, these are the books that I have done. <coughs> Unfortunately, this fortunate man to me is supposed to not be accompanying me, because he he trabaja. Pero ella hizo todos los todas las fotos de mis libros. Este es un una huerta en Hawaii. Este es Chicago, donde vivimos. 
Ustedes pueden ver esta estatua. No, la estatua es escultor. Escu ¿Escultura? Escultura. Se llama Cloud Gate. ¿Lo conocen? It's uh, stainless steel. And it reflects the entire uh, skyline of Chicago. It is very interesting. They call it the big beam. <laughs> and this one is the sunrise in Nevada. Okay, I'll be quoting from each of these books. That's the sunset in Nevada on the back of this one. That's the um, Bouchard Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia. Well, outside of there, it's very famous gardens. This, and you've seen that, but this is a sunset in, on a cloudy day in Nevada. Nevada has incredible sunrises and sunsets, particularly in the summertime when there's a few, only a few clouds. It's just amazing. As you can see from this, this one on the back of this book, this one. We off, this was taken out our front door. It's a sunrise in the valley. Okay. El primer poema se llama Las Hojas de Otoño. And he says, Las Hojas de Otoño. Las hojas, bailarinas de otoño, sin el color verde vibrante, ahora vestidas en diversas matices, moreno, amarillo y rojo, bailan al ritmo del viento frío. El presagio de invierno áspero, cuando toda la naturaleza, naturaleza duerme, esperando nueva luz fresca. Empujadas a tiempo de la música misteriosa de las brisas otoñales, buscan refugio en los rincones, escondidos donde pueden suspirar y empezar el proceso de degenerarse cubiertas en la opiata de nieve. That entire poem is a metaphor. Do you understand what I'm talking about? In Nevada, it's really interesting. This time of year, particularly, when the wind is blowing, the leaves look like they're just dancing in the streets. It's just amazing. Because the wind's always... Carson City is the windiest city in the United States, contrary to what everybody thinks. They think it's Chicago. We have 364 days a year where there's wind. But in the, in the winter, in the fall, the leaves are that way. My wife took this picture of the leaf and it was in color. This book doesn't have color in it. But this was the leaf that was there. But the leaves just seem to dance and that's why I call them the ballerinas of fall. I'll read you the translation. If you translate a poem into another language, you have to arrange it so that it becomes a poem in that language also. But you can't translate it exactly and make it come that way. Everybody's nodding their head, you understand, because you I've done a lot of translation of them on my life. In fact I translated the DMV manual <laughs> after I translated it I hate to say this, but about sixty percent of the Latinos flunked it because they had the they had the answers to the old one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay. Leaves. The ballerinas of autumn, without the vibrant green, green of summer, dressed in various colors, brown, yellow, orange, and red, now dance to the rhythm of the cold wind, the omen of a harsh winter, when all nature sleeps and dreams, hoping for the promise of welcome and refreshing light of spring. Driven to the uh, tempo of mysterious music of autumn breezes, the most fortunate seek refuge in hidden corners where they can assuredly rest and begin the process of decay, gently nestled in the opiate of snow. This is, do you recognize the form in this? I don't know if you've got copies of these. I sent copies to Mr. Bradford. 
14 lines. What do you think it is? Is it literature, Spanish literature? 14 lines? Does that mean anything? Sonnets? You've heard of sonnets. The sonnets of Portuguese and sonnets. 14 lines. Mine are not Elizabethan or Italian sonnets by any means, but it's, in a, it's a sonnet. It's 14 lines. Now, I, that's probably my favorite because it, it's definitely a, an idea of metaphors. Poetry has all sorts of kind of forms. And one of the things I always like to say and tell people is language, even in English, has its own meter and uh, rhyme that you think about it. The way we speak, the way we talk, is, there's some kind of rhythm to it. Okay. So like um, Walt Whitman, I don't use rhyme very often or even meter. In Spanish, I use meter more often. And in, can anyone of you, do you take, anybody take Spanish literature at all? Uh, how do they count meter, anybody know? The meter in Spanish is they count the syllables. And it depends on how many syllables. If there are 14 syllables in a line, each line has to have 14 syllables. A lot of my Spanish ones do have a meter, not all of them, but some of them do. Um, another example of this metaphor thing, I like to read this one because I wrote this one. I told you they can come to me anywhere. I wrote this one in the... <coughs> The stadium at Carson High School when my second son graduated in 1992. I was sitting there, it was a hot day, it was boring. The, the teacher, the talks were boring. You've been to commencement exercises, you know what it is. And I sat there and read, wrote this. And I had been cutting the strawberry runners on the strawberries we grow in our house. And it came to me. So, and the name of it is Cutting Strawberry Runners. This is in English. This is a technique that some poets use. They will use the first, the title of the poem as the first line. And that's what is in this one. So as I'm reading it, I have to start with the title. Cutting strawberry runners in late spring brings certain trepidation, but resolve to assist a new generation in sending down roots into fertile soil carefully prepared by many long since return to earth beneath those tender shoots. Older plants continue to produce succulent berries, red, vibrant, and enticing, while still sheltering their vulnerable project. <coughs> Yet now each begins imperceptibly, imperceptibly to wilt in life, giving the perilous sun. In spite of mature vigor, all feel inevitable loss of, as runners are meticulously severed, anchored, and nourished with anxious tears. Do you see the metaphor in here? The father seeing his son graduate from high school and having trepidation because he's going out on his own and he's like the new strawberries that are going to be planted and hopefully he will be able to grow and have something. It's called graduation day at the farm. Now, if you notice how I was reading it, another uh, technique that poets use, particularly in, in lately in modern poetry, is line breaks. With the line break, the very last word can be emphasized enough that it has can take on a different meaning, and the first word of the next line can also be emphasized and take on a different meaning. So, it, cutting strawberry runners in late spring brings certain, and I pause, trepidation, but resolve to assist a new generation in sending down roots into. Now even a uh, preposition can have a different meaning and it can be emphasized into fertile soil carefully prepared by many long since return to earth. So 
if you hear modern poetry, sometimes you'll see if even the poet will, might read it with those line breaks so you can understand that. My wife and I sing a lot. We sing uh, with the Carson Chamber singers, and I have a real hard time with these directors to tell you that, that you shouldn't breathe in this song where there's a comma. <laughs> well, the poet put the comma there, or he put a line break there, and started the next line with a capitalized letter for a reason. So you, I argue with them over that, but they need to take that into consideration. There are different themes in my works. As you notice, I talk about the seasons. I talk about certain periods in life. Each of these books has a number of different things in it. I talk about, uh, I actually have a, love, have a love poem. I'll read to that to you later. I have some that talk about poetic inspiration itself, different memories, I mean, a number of themes. But music is one of the things that has inspired me to for a lot of my poems. The next one I'm going to read to you is called Nocturno Español Segundo, because I've had, I have a first one. That is in this book. I have to tell you how this came about. Your, um, well, I have to tell you, it's ironic that I graduated from Brigham Young University, and I graduated from Utah State University, and your colors are blue and white, right? I am allergic to blue dye. I can't wear anything blue. I can't sit on anything blue. So when I go to football games, what do I wear? <laughs> Red? <laughs> University of Utah? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but it, it's ironic that I'm allergic to blue dye. Okay. The reason I said that, because uh, Brigham Young University, the Brigham Young University ballroom dancers came to Carson City one time and, and performed for us. It was just amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen them perform, but they are fantastic. And and what they did inspired this one. This is this is in four quintains, they're called. In other words, quintain is their five five lines and there are four of them. El Espíritu y Belleza de España se despliega en el ritmo del flamenco. Espejo del ánimo the ardor latino, incorporado en esas castañetas y las máscaras de los bailadores. En el fuego y las pir piruetas se trata de hacer, hacerse regocijar esta alma, triste al pensar en la gloria perdida que gozaba España en los días pasados, de armadas, reyes y conquistadores. Se fluyen las faldas y capas rojas, la música encantada y repleta, evocando siluetas de arte pura, simbolizada en muñecas giradas por adonices escultos gentiles. Con la última inclinación en la caída del talón, me despiertan de este sueño a esa realidad que siempre me acecha. Más guardo una chispa de esta hermosura para inspirar inspiración futura en dios, días ásperos. I use a little twist here on the, the meaning of muñecas. What are muñecas? Wrists. And they're also dolls, right? Well, they're dancing, and they're probably using their wrists, but at the same time, they're, they could be dolls. <laughs> you could call them a doll. But I use that here for a donisis. Does anybody know what that is? Adonis? You've heard of the Greek god Adonis? Very nice, young-looking man. That's what this is talking about. We were watching them dance, doing the flamenco. And the colors were just amazing. Now I'll read it in English, just so you may get the whole thing. For my sisters. The spirit and beauty of Spain is 
is manifested in the rhythm of the flamenco. The mirror of Latin verb and passion, which is embodied in the castanets, costumes, and masks of the dancers. With the fire and pirouettes, the saddened soul, the saddened soul attempts to rejoice, but is overcome with the contemplation of the now lost glory that once was Spain of the days of Armadas, kings, and conquistadores. The skirts and capes flow quickly to the haunting music, replete with the vision of pure art, embodied, embodied on dolls spinning under the arms of the sculpted and lively Adonises. As a final bow and the curtain falling, I am awakened from this artistic dream to re real reality which continues to stalk me. Yet I treasure a spark of this beauty for future inspiration on inevitable dark days. One of the things that I, I try to do with my poetry is end on a high note. It doesn't always happen, but I try to do that. This book is mostly religious. A lot of you are returning missionaries. So you would, you would understand this a lot. But these others have some in there, but not like this last book. Now I've got a fourth that's going to be coming out, but I don't know when that's going to be. It'll probably it might be next year, we'll see. But it has some new ones that I just got. Let me read one to you in Portuguese. It's called Tempestade de Verão. And this is about spring, uh, summer. This is another one of my seasonal poems. Again, this is a sonnet. For some reason, sonnets the form that, that I can express myself the best in. I don't know why, it just happens that way. The last four lines, and particularly the last line of the sonnet, is the one that is the clincher. One of the things that poets like to do, and the group I used to belong to in Carson City, they helped train us to be poems, poets, was talking about the uh, closure of the poem. Sometimes you can leave it open-ended depending on the subject, but the closure is very important, particularly your last line. So hopefully you might understand it in this one. Tempestade de verão, this is a summer storm. O seu de plena manhã mostra só com suas Nuvens multicores, os milagres ocultos e nus de criação girando em redor do sol, da vida a este mundo. Hoje ajoelhamos-nos perante o altar de manhã a render graças por conceder-nos outro dia mais para gozar de novo o ar fresco, a liberdade a brisa quente. A tarde, com suas tempestades, lava esta cena com as lágrimas e mistura os cores a cinza, desanimando a um céu alegre. Here's the translation. Wondrous morning sky displays in many multicolored clouds, the hidden, naked miracles of this creation revolving around the sun, the giver of life to our world. Today we kneel at the altar of mourning to express gratitude for granting us another day to again enjoy fresh air, freedom, and a warm breeze. Afternoon, with its disturbing storms, bathes this scene with tears and changes the earlier colors to gray disheartening even a happy sky. That one is one that didn't land, didn't end on a happy note, but it's talking about storms. Okay, let's see. We want to leave some time so you have some time to ask a few questions. So I'll try and cut this down. I would like to read you my love poem. I have written some that are a little frivolous, I think I might read you the very last one to the man who shot his computer. <laughs> but this one is, <clears throat> let's see where it is up here. Cantique d'amour, using the French. A 
mean uh, him to music? Him to love, I mean. Look at me with your eyes deep and dark, penetrating even to my very center. Speak to me only with eyes longing to tell me mysteries I cannot know. Hear my song of loving melodies meant just for you. Feel my breath on your cheek as it validates my being still striving to know you. Smell the flowers given as tokens of my love for you. Touch me gently, caressing even my very spirit. Whisper now quietly, hush your fears, and join me in my journey through the clouds. That's my attempt at a love poem. Uh, I appreciate my wife because she she did a lot of the photography in here, and she is a great photographer, but she couldn't come. A week from tomorrow, I'm going to be giving a similar lecture at the high school in Carson City, and she can be there, so she can talk about the photography. Okay, uh, this one I want to read to you because it's very intimate to me, and it can probably give you some ideas of some of the intimate moments you all have within yourselves or in certain areas. Uh, it's called Santuario Atesorado, and it is also translated. Okay. I have to tell myself, I have to have the page numbers in here so I don't miss them. <coughs> Very often, a poem will come to me in the quiet of the night. I wake up, two o'clock in the morning, and there it is coming, and I have to write it down or it goes away. But it, it's often in, when I'm contemplating things that are very important, family, my religion, who I am, what I've done, the gratitude I have for all of these things. My sisters, appreciate both of them. Santuario Atesorado. Pocas veces puedo invitar visitas al santuario mío donde mis deseos más profundos queden cerrados para liberación en día memorable. Muchos saben que no deben entrar en mi santuario a ruidos porque es tierra santa y me dejan en paz para comunicarme con mi destino. Los que por desgracia interrumpen, interrumpen mi, sal, mi solitud comprenden de inmediato la indiscreción que han cometido. No por mi eno enojo ni por impaciencia, sino por sentirse ajenos e incómodos en la presencia de inspiración desnuda. No quiero salir de ahí cuando se toca el teléfono con un insecto nocivo indicando que el mundo me llama a volver a la realidad de luchar para sobrevivir. Como me me, cuando me meto una vez más en el asilo guardado para mis pensamientos privados y reservados, respiro aire fresco y recojo esfuer esfuerzo para aguantar otro día con sus desdichas. Okay, I'll read it in, in English. Seldom do I invite visitors into my sanctuary when my deepest desires remain locked awaiting liberation on a memorable day. Many know that they should enter quietly since where they stand is holy ground, and they must leave me in peace to confer with my destiny. Those who unfortunately interrupt my solitude comprehend immediately the indiscretion they, they have committed, not because of anger nor impatience, but they are sure to feel uncomfortable in the presence of naked inspiration. 
I dislike leaving when the telephone rings like a pesky insect, reminding me, reminding me the world has called, piercing my solitude, Sign signaling my return to the unwanted battle on survival. When I can find myself once more, one more time, in this asylum, storage for my private and reserved thoughts, I take in its fresh air to muster the strength to, to withstand another day with its misfortune. It's amazing. I've even had poems come to me when I'm walking down a busy street with people just walking all around me. Looking, particularly in Chicago, there's so many people. It's just crazy that everyone's talking about a poem and they come to me. So I keep a little pad of paper so when I sit down, I can sit down and write something. Because you don't always have a computer or a handheld and you can make notes. Sometimes a handheld. I'm not part of that generation. I'm sure all of you guys are. Okay. Um, there are two more I would like to read to you. Well, let's see. The very first one in here is one of my favorites, too. It's called Pot Belly Stoves. Anybody seen the Pot Belly Stove? Okay. There's a picture of one. This is one, an old German one. It's in my dentist's office. And after I wrote the poem, he says, oh, I'm going to get some of your books and I'll put them in there and you have them in there so people. But he has this uh, pot belly stove in his, he had bought it and just sits it in his office. It doesn't work, but he, 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 antique, he collects antiques like that. Not long ago on cold days of winter, many there were who would surround the pot belly stoves in country stores spinning a tale or two of folklore, spiced with feats of valor and war stories, all of which were embellished, as is human, while they were recounted. Likewise, the day's news and recent sports events were rehearsed again, along with weather predictions, as well as hopes for the coming, season, coming season's crops. Farm failures, Floods and other calamities alike were relived with ambivalence. But the good family news and who had left the community were also revealed. Years passed and economic hardships came and went, as did times of war and peace. Children grew up and even members of the groups, groups passed on. The cities grew, eliminating the need for the country stores and the pot belly stoves disappeared. The pot belly stove councils disappeared, replaced by gatherings at the gym and the infamous water cooler confabs. Conversations have not changed much. Happy and sad mixed with melancholy remembrances. While the traces of those memorable moments with their myriad tales have now been lost on the nostalgic wind of winter. That's one of my best closures that I've done. Nostalgic wind of winter. Nostalgia is one of those words that just reeks with feeling and emotions, like melancholy and sadness. Mel uh, that's another one that is, you can use. Uh, one that that is also in this book. It's called Cash Valley. And this one came to me. Let's see, I've got to find the right page. Because there's a picture that goes along with it. My wife took this picture driving towards the Wealthy Mountains. But I was driving on that road and I was looking up at the springtime and it was green and the horses were in the, some of the fields and You've seen it. You've all seen it if you live in this valley. And it just overwhelmed me. And so I had to write this poem. And since it's about cash flow and you all live here, I'm going to read it to you. Another technique that I use that many of them don't is the font on a poem in your book may have some meaning. This one is in a place <coughs> called Papyrus, the Papyrus font. 
And because this is a memory and it's nostalgic, that's why I use my Bible. The picturesque pastoral beauty of my beloved home with cattle, sheep, horses, and all their awe-inspiring magnificence invades my very being with explosive intensity as I contemplate these wonders. The phenomena of lush pastures of green against the blue sky surrounded by majestic mountains rising above cause my breast to swell with gratitude and longing to freeze the hallowed vision in elusive, intangible time. Yet I know there will be other days when the brilliance of the sun will not magnify the radiance around me and gray skies will deafen my elation and immersion in this artistic setting. But those gray days will serve to remind me to wait with sure resolve for that glorious sunrise promise to those who are patient and endure. That's casual. I'll leave it at that. Uh, the one I really wanted to read to you was is Omaha Beach. It's also in one of these. I did it in, in Spanish and English, and I'll tell you what inspired it. Um, one of my sons attended BYU Idaho and was in their music department. One of you students, a very gifted young man, composed a number for the band in BYU Idaho called Omaha Beach. His grandfather had served in World War II and went on Omaha, Omaha Beach. If you know what that is, that's the beachhead that they established in World War II coming from England over to France. Uh, St. Lowe and uh, what's the other city there? Anyway, Caen. Those two cities took a lot of the, the men that survived. But the poem, the, the music that he uh, created gave you the feeling of the desperation they felt going on that beach trying to, and they didn't know where the shooting was going to come from. The Germans, and how many of them would die and all, and all that kind of thing. The music shows that and then all of a sudden it goes almost completely quiet and all you hear is the ring of the bell. And that music just overwhelmed me and so I had to read, read this, write this poem and I talked about the, that feeling of that complete quiet and the peace that came with the ringing of the bells when the bell was over. Okay, uh, one that I would like to have read to you is Crescendo. Uh, it was inspired by music, it's in English. Samuel Barber was a famous composer. He, he composed uh, Daja for Strings. Anybody ever seen it or listened to it? He uh, composed it after his mother had died, just recently after his mother had died. And if you listen to it, it just increases in intensity. The sorrow and the feeling that he had from his mother's death just keeps increasing in the whole thing until the point that he almost explodes in the music. And then it goes quiet. And then he, he has these some music part of it is just very quiet and peaceful and then it starts to wind up a little again and then it finally closes with some resolution. But you will find with the death of a loved one that that's exactly what happens to you. You feel, you have sorrow, it just keeps building. You may even have anger because they've taken away from you and it just keeps building and this sorrow. You feel like you're going to explode and eventually you let go. But it can return because it came back <coughs> in his music also. Especially at times when you least expect it. You will have this overwhelming feeling of sadness for a loss of a loved one. And I, these tragedies we're seeing in, in the United States today, I just can't see how it, 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 it's overwhelming. Another one I like is a new one that isn't published is Quail Run. We have a lot of quail in Carson City. They're just running everywhere. One day we counted 23 hatchlings with the, the mother crossing the street close to us. It was just amazing. So I had to write this one about Quail Run. But maybe you'll read it in my next book. I'll now get some time. I haven't given a lot, but I hope you have some questions. I don't know if I can answer them all, but... Thank you.
<coughs> yes. Give me your name. Just give me your first name. Spanish or English? Sam, Sam, it's you, Sam. Uh, bueno, yo me llamo Sam y no sé si podría hacer la pregunta en español. Um, I am curious, like, a lot of people, I like, think, have this idea that, like, people who are very logical thinking and maybe, like, kind of that lawyer side um, have a hard time, like, being artistic and creative and vice versa. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I wanted to ask you, like, what your experience with kind of using both of those, like, mentalities, I guess, and, like, how you make that work. Ever since I was a little child, I've been very sensitive. My mother said I used to take this old record player we had and, and the old breakable records that we used to have, and she said I was always throwing them on the the phonograph to listen to these records. And some of them were, you know, they were sad. You've heard this song, Smile, Though Your Heart Is Breaking. She had that one on there. And I'd sit and cry and cry and cry. <laughs> I don't know, I guess I've just had an affinity for artistic and spiritual things like that. And even though I was in, even though I was immersed in that logical thinking and that adversarial, uh, atmosphere of the attorney, I tried to keep my balance the best that I could. I had a good friend in Elko that was a patriarch in, one, in the Elko Stake, and he was an attorney. And I looked at him one day and I said, Brother Erdley, how do you maintain your balance between the spirituality and the adversarial nature of the law? He wouldn't answer my question. He just kind of ignored it. He, but that was wise on his part, because he made me answer for myself. And I was able to do that. And it's been a blessing in disguise, because now I feel it and understand it much more. A lot of these came while I was still on the journey. And it's just, I don't know, it's a gift. You know, you all have gifts. You have gifts of lang language, I'm sure. That's why you're in this class. I hope that helps. Um, I don't know if I've answered completely. Anybody? Who's your favorite poet? Oh, my gosh. Robert Frost. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, she guessed yeah, she it. <laughs> I don't know if he's really my favorite. I've got a lot. I like uh, Emily Dickinson, Henry, uh, Walt Wordsworth. Gabriela Mistral, Pablo Neruda, oh, what's the one in Mexico, what's his name? Octavio Paz. Octavio Paz, <laughs> Octavio Paz. Um, one of my favorites in Spain was, uh, oh, what's his name? He was one of the, uh, oh, Francisco de Quevedo. He was very cynical. He had some very interesting poems. But Lope de Vega, I don't know if you've studied enough literature yet, Lope de Vega is a master. We, we enthroned Shakespeare saying that he did these 50 dramas over his lifetime because all we know is English. But Lope de Vega did close to 1,600 that were just exactly as, that were all of them just as good as any of Shakespeare's. <coughs> he was incredible. So I like him. I, Federico de Garcia Lorca also really like him. Any other questions? Yes. Do you write in German? I have one poem in German, but I haven't finished it yet. I have a mentor in, in Carson City who speaks German. He's from Switzerland and we, and we get together. He's helping me finish it up. I have one in Italian, so that one's not quite that new. I write in, I have one poem in this book as one stanza in French. Questions? Yes? What made you, okay, what made you um, want to learn other languages and how did you go about doing that? Well, it was my mission. 
he stole my thunder. Because <laughs> he well, told you where I learned. Because no, normally people will ask me, where did you, even in Spanish, where did you learn Spanish? And I always say, well, in a foreign country. And they say, oh, which one? I said, California. <laughs> it is a foreign country, believe me. We live close enough that we know. But, um, but where in California? Our family has a gift for languages. And we have had in our family. My mother used to go to her um, great-grandmother, grandmother's house who was from Denmark, and she didn't speak English very well, and she'd speak to him in Danish. And for some reason, my mother could understand her. I don't know how, but she did. But she never learned any other languages. And, and my brother speaks Korean. Uh, his son went to Poland and speaks Polish. My oldest son went to Japan. He's Japanese. And he also, while he was in Japan, had to teach Spanish, because he had Spanish in high school. You don't really realize how there's a lot of cross-cultural things. The sound system in Japan is exactly like Spanish. So there are a lot of Japanese and Hispanics that cross over. If you remember, years ago, the uh, president or premier, I don't know what they call him in Peru, was a Japanese man who spoke Spanish very well. Well, my son found a lot of Hispanics in uh, Tokyo, and he had to teach them in Spanish also. But, and I have a son that went to Brazil, and he speaks Portuguese, and he speaks Spanish now too. He's had to, he was forced to. I served as the branch president for the Spanish branch in Carson City for about five years. Great experience. We started out with six people. One day we had 10 baptisms. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You didn't answer his question. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, what part of California? Is, was it the south? San Diego, Long Beach? Back then, it was the whole state. The whole plus state. Arizona, plus and Las Vegas. Oh, wow. That was, was a lot of, uh, a lot lot of walking. <laughs> 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 we covered a lot of territory. We <laughs> 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 spent time in India. Oh, OK. That wow. tells you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> when I left the mission, they combined all of our missionaries with the English-speaking California missions, and, and yet they were the Spanish elders. But that was six months after I left. They did expand those missions. There was also the, the, the Spanish-American mission, which was in Mexico and Texas. Any other questions? Like, I think we're done. I don't know what time you do. We still got a couple more minutes. Come on, guys. Hi, wait there. Um, <coughs> Jonathan. So what happened in your high school class that sparked that inspiration? We studied poetry, Robert Frost, and Emily Dickinson is one of my favorites. The Hermitage, the Hermit poetess. I heard some of hers are really very terse and just to the, to the point, very good. Um, I don't know, Longfellow, his Children's Hour, and one that he wrote right after his wife was killed and then his children in a fire in their house. Just tears at your heartstrings if you, if you know the background on it. A lot of literal, literature people will tell you, and this probably goes back to the Parnassians, that you don't, you just take from literature its background. You, you don't give it any uh, weight when you come to looking at the, the art, the work. Okay, you don't even consider the background. But that myth misses so much, particularly in that poem by uh, Longfellow. If you didn't know that his wife had been killed, plus some of his children in that fire, uh, it wouldn't mean a lot to you. But since you know that, that poem is just, like I said, it's heartrending. Any other questions? Yes? Do you think? There are certain experiences or feelings that are easier to write about in other languages? Uh, particularly Italian is very susceptible to musical and meter and that. And that's why there's so much music in Italian. Uh, those people are amazing. They sing all the time, everyone. Everybody in Italy sings. And so that's why we have so many uh, opera singers that are Italian. 
One of my favorites is Andrea Bocelli. I don't know many, how many of you have heard his music. Even though he's blind, he's just amazing. Just incredible. But the Italian is that way. French, somewhat too. Spanish, also. The Latin languages do lend themselves to. The, the idea of this Latin verb, we call it, you know, their energy comes through in the languages. Now, English and German and the northern languages, they're a little more state and proper. Particularly the Germans, they're very engineering, engineered. But mostly, it's the spirit of the language. Spanish. If you're interested, you've got, I've got cards here. You can take a look at them and have one before you go. Um, if you like my work, Tell your friends if you don't come and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to learn multiple languages more than just two? <clears throat> Gee, I've been asked a lot of questions, but that was probably the hardest. To think of. Uh, first of all, you have to like the, language, the new language that you learn. Uh, I don't say my, I'm LDS, you know that, and I don't say my prayers in English. They're in Spanish. In the family, they're in English, but mine are not. They're in Spanish. I read every morning. I read five languages every morning from the scriptures. That helps me maintain them. But um, if you get your that second language down very well, learn the grammar completely. You've got to know the grammar. It will carry it over into the other languages. If you understand the subjunctive and why it's used and how often it's used, you carry it over even into German. It has subjunctive. But did you know we have a subjunctive in English? Anybody know what it is? The as if clause. If I were rich, I would be famous or something. Instead of saying I w was famous or is famous or were famous, well, you use were. Anyway, that's the subjunctive in English plus uh, the as if clause. If you know, if you understand English and you teach it, I teach Spanish in. Carson City and I've also taught in Reno at, at a college. The first thing I learn when I go there is I have to teach those kids English. I don't know what they're what you what you're getting out of call, your high school classes, but I mention the word indirect object or direct object and I get these stares like, what's he talking about? And I think, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> it's true, I have to teach English course through the <coughs> eyes of Spanish. Any other questions? Yes. Going along with that, do you ever get confused with like languages, knowing so many languages? Oh, it happens all it the time. Happen. I'll be speaking in one and I end up saying a couple words in another one, but I really, uh, I really intensely try and not confuse them. One advice I give to Latinos all the time is, if you want your children to learn both languages perfectly, you can't mix the two languages up or they, they get confused. One parent speaks only Spanish to them, one speaks only English. Then they'll learn them perfectly. The Modern Language Institute has stressed that. That's why the Chicanos in California were having so much trouble in school a lot of times, is that they, learned, they didn't learn them perfectly. One of the teachers we had here, she was from Switzerland. She spoke five languages perfectly. And I, we asked her, well, how did, did you get five languages? Well, she learned English in school. So she saw, associated that language with school. She had a mother that was French, taught her French, only taught, spoke French to her. So she got learned that one perfectly. Her father was German, well, spoke German. So he spoke that only to her. So she had three languages down perfectly. Plus she had a grandmother that spoke Romanish and a grandmother that spoke Italian, or grandfather that spoke Italian. So
So she had five languages perfectly from childhood. And that's a good example of that. So you try and, I associate one language with one person and one with another. If I meet someone that I know is Portuguese, immediately my mind switches to Portuguese. Same thing with German. I have that friend from Switzerland. As soon as I see him, I greet him in German and we talk in German. And that's the best way you can maintain them. It really works. And if I see a Hispanic, I immediately speak Spanish to him, even though sometimes they'll answer me in English and then they'll think, oh, he's speaking Spanish. <laughs> you will have that experience too, I'm sure. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you very much. And hopefully you can have the same experience as I've had. Maybe not exactly, but I encourage you. You love what you're doing, dedicate yourself to it, and go to it. My last job I had was the best one I had ever had in my life. I was the attorney for Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And I had to learn it all new because it's a new field, completely. But if you ask me about emergency management, I will be there and I can tell you about it. What you have to do in your house, what you have to do in your community, in the state, in the nation. I, it took me 12 years, but I got it.